Welcome. Thanks for picking this session today. Today, um, it was advertised as Python metaprogramming with spreadsheets, and I've given it the catchy you know, tagline before the title of, oh, sorry. Yeah, you, I was given the go ahead, sorry. You be redundant. <laughs> sorry. I have a purpose and a microphone. It's his fault. <laughs> Okay, hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this session. I'd like to introduce Hader, uh, Javier Candera. And Thank you. Yes. And he is a Python um, programmer, but sometimes he just likes to write code that does writes a Python for him. Yes. Thank you. Well, let's make a loud welcome. Thanks, Elizabeth. And, and that description, that kind of bio, is exactly what these 90 minutes are about, about um, coding better in the sense that you write better code and you also have a better life while writing it. Because instead of writing it yourself, you write a program that does it for you. So um, this is an intermediate uh, tutorial in the sense that uh, complete beginners will find it a bit difficult. But if you've used Python at all, you will be able to follow it. It um, is more of a tutorial lecture than a workshop. So um, I don't have materials for you. They will be available after the tutorial, and you can follow them. But it's best, I think, if you just interrupt me during the session at any point, and we do this together at once. So let's start with Python metaprogramming with spreadsheets. I'm Javier. And I solve, I, I solve people, solve their business needs with code, which is kind of a pun because sometimes I don't use code. It's the business needs have code, right? And uh, this is one of my clients. This, this tutorial is based on actual work that I've done for you know, paying clients. And uh, she runs a data consultancy, and she has data that needs to be validated from an energy regulator that runs you know, programs and and everybody has data from disparate sources. We need to validate it together. And she has a very good description of the validation rules. She's one of those clients with very, very uh, nice specs. And she has them in a spreadsheet, like many of us do. Like, who here doesn't have at least one spreadsheet, the purpose of which isn't calculating? Like, who doesn't have a spreadsheet for, or better asking the positive, who has a spreadsheet that is only like a small database, just to keep rows and columns of things? Yeah. So who doesn't? So I can't see, oh, OK, I needed one hand up. So like many people, she has a spreadsheet, like I do and like m many of you do. So I also have another client, Adrian, who needs to test this medical instrument. And inside this engineering company, they have, of course, complete descriptions of the hardware, both of the medical instrument and the dedicated tester that they use to test the boards during manufacture. And of course, they have it in a spreadsheet. So you can imagine where this is going. Spreadsheets are enables of order. And they're kind of maligned sometimes, but they're amazing because they enable people to do things that they need to do quickly. And they reflect who you are. If you are kind of a mess, your spreadsheet will be a mess. If you're tidy, your spreadsheet will be tidy. And spreadsheets, you can consider spreadsheet as the tool that writes a spreadsheet or as the document. You can pick either or both. I think they're both amazing. But today, we're talking about the documents, not the spreadsheet as a program. We don't care about that. So organized people are consistent. And these two are good professionals, a DBA and a software. Um, engineer, and the spreadsheets become informal specs. They're not formal in any way because there's no document definition, but they're internally consistent, and they're so, so good that maybe we could use code to interpret these specs. Right? Instead of doing it by hand and being error prone like humans are, we write code that will do things consistently, at least as consistently as the specs were written. And that's called metaprogramming. So, metaprogramming, huh? Programming by treating code as data. It's as simple as that. If um, I just read today on Hacker News and I added, it's writing code that deals with code. So if your code only deals with um, data and business problems, it's not metaprogramming. The moment your code deals with code itself, it is metaprogramming. And you already have a machine readable problem description, which is a spreadsheet. 
And if the person giving you the problem is of that tidy and orderly kind, you're good. Isn't it difficult? <coughs> well, I'm not the you know, greatest programmer. I, think, I like to think I'm a good professional, but I'm not necessarily, you know, Koenig and, and Ritchie. And, you know, the sheep has already sailed here. We're programmers in this room, right? So what are you trying to hide? Ah, level and hate. Not really. Not really. Look, you're already automating other people's jobs all the time, right? So isn't it about time you wake up? Well, first you do this for a living, and when you do this, people feel unsure about it. You sell them all the benefits of automating. So it's time to sell yourself on the benefit of automating your own work. So this is what I'm going to do next. I'm going to sell you on the benefit, and the first one is that it makes boring work interesting. And I don't mean to speak ill, but really validating data, writing that code by hand, crazy. Writing a little compiler that writes little uh, validation rules and puts them in a Django model for you suddenly becomes an interesting problem, as well as giving you the other benefits. So first benefit, metaprogramming saves bugs, in the sense, not in the sense that it keeps them, it just saves you bugs. <coughs> it prevents errors. And I'm not going to claim that it prevents all kind of errors. It prevents the kind of errors from being inconsistent. If you have to uh, apply a rule the same way 50 times by hand, you make mistakes. There won't be errors. There'll be more kind of mistakes. While a program will be consistent. It will be either wrong all the time or right all the time. We'll get to that. So those type of errors are saved. Second is you write less code. And I don't have a. Um, reference, but it's in Code Complete by McConnell, it's everywhere. If you write less code, you'll make less bugs. Because, funnily enough, bugs are correlated with the number of lines you write, more or less across the board. The other thing that you do is that you make bugs consistent by making um, assumptions explicit. So, as I said, these two people, clients of mine, are really tidy, and they're very consistent but the spec is semi-formal, and sometimes I have to interpret it. Am I right? Am I wrong? If I did it by hand, maybe I would take notes, maybe I wouldn't. If I do it in a program, my assumption of what they meant is written down. So I make bugs consistent by making assumptions explicit. If the assumption is good, then it's not a bug. If the assumption is bad, then it's a bug, but I can fix it once and for all, and not in the 100 or 150 places that that rule has been applied. And that has the extra benefit, is that it helps make ambiguous specifications more clear, which is something that we all have in any type of work that we do. I think if you work in aerospace, maybe you don't, and you, you work to really, really, really tight specs, but anywhere we know that even the best clients sometimes is, is ambiguous or contradictory in the specification. So this is a lot of advantage on the quality of the project. This is, I'm selling this to you, your programmers, but you can see also like the business value of this. Now let's see another big business value, which is it saves time, right? It saves time. First, it reduces the turnaround in changes. Um, I mean, this, is, this sounds like a brag, but this is like the real benefit of this. The other day, I had um, a conference call with Jen and some of the business analysts, and I had a list of questions. And the second half of the call was for the other person working with me to ask his questions. So I used that time to make the fixes and changes that needed to be done from my first half of the call. By the end of the call, I had already applied all the modifications because Everything was changed by my code. I only had to change three bits in my code generation script. Then the second thing is that that time that you save, it doesn't go away. It means that you still have it. You have a budget of, I don't know, 300 hours. If you are able to respond to change faster, you can spend more time you know, solving defects that are actual defects, adding features, writing documentation, and this, by the way, is something that is, that is a trade-off, right? It's like test-driven development. You do an investment up front that pays later. So yeah, consider how much you need it. But I would say that for anything that is not completely specified, which is really any programming project, it's worth it. The other thing is it yields more readable code. Not always. Like optimizing compilers, 
make a mess of things in order to get performance. But one of the advantages of consistency is that you can read the code and it always looks the same way. Like when I write my Django models with a bit of code, I always have the validators in the same place, I always have my blank true where it has to be, I always have it in the same place, and if anybody says, oh, I don't like this convention, I need to change it, changing the convention is a five minute job of changing the code generator. So this is something that we get via code generator. But I haven't spoken of the second kind of metaprogramming that we're gonna talk about today. In fact, it's the one we're gonna be talking about mainly. And that one, what it does is it yields better APIs with reflection. So we've talked of code generation and reflection, which are the two kinds of metaprogrammings that we're talking about today. Let's see what each one is. So different problems have different solutions. Remember, the problem of data validation, by the way, I didn't choose the technologies, which is also something that we all can relate to. I don't think they're bad, but I already came in the project that was already a Django app, and already came in the project they had already invested in a big tester that had a LabJack. I'll explain what it is later. So we already had a Django app, so I said, let's validate using the Django framework for validation, right? It already has validators for the forms, so we write models, we write model forms, we make validators that go in the model forms, and that is how we we'll validate this data. It's working very well, and the solution has been to just generate code. So the Django, the, the Django models are not written by me, they're written by a program that I wrote. With the head hardware API and a LabJack device, the solution is something called reflection. When the material is ready, you can look up the paper where reflection was, was for the first time um, described. And it was in small talk, by the, by the way, this is one of the stories of how bad it was in the beginning. So the way they did it is they had to catch an exception every time a bad method was called or a bad message was passed to an object and solve it this way. We don't have to do this because in Django we have ways to add arbitrary methods to objects that don't have it and uh, it's called getter. We'll see it today. It's the main, it's the main uh, bit of the, of the tutorial. So, oops, I didn't mean to do this. I meant to do this. So, the big difference is that with code generation, you read your spreadsheet at a certain compilation time. Well, it's, it's kind of a compiler. In fact, it is a compiler, right? So, you have a, a step in which you generate code, which then goes in your repo, and that is before you run the code. And then when you run the code, nothing happens with the spreadsheet. You could throw it out. While with reflection, the spreadsheet the document that specifies how the thing should work is read at runtime. So you don't have to do anything except save the correct version of the spreadsheet in your repo to go with your code, and your code will read it. And here, the code is written by your program, and here the code is actually written by you. You don't have any code generation, or you may have for other reasons. You write code that interprets the spreadsheet at runtime. So, we have a plan for today, which was to talk about code generation with Django and API design and implementation via reflection. So it was like two sub-tutorials. But the truth is that um, I have too much material and I think the API design and implementation is much more interesting. So my plan is maybe get to the Django part and do a short demo at the end, or you can, you know, buttonhole me in the hallways and ask me about it. I'll be very happy to talk to you. But really, use the, the full, essentially we'll have an hour plus questions and interruptions. I welcome interruption at any time. To talk about API design and implementation via reflection. And um, I hope it's worth your time. So how it'll work is, sorry the no downloads, I'm really, really sorry. This is select tutorial, as you can see. I'm going to be showing you, um, but wait, please interrupt at any time. So um, that way we can make it interactive and try to make the material available. But we're going to be working out of an IPython uh, notebook. So you'll be seeing the code, and you'll be seeing all the progression of how everything works. So um, I'll start with a description of the problem a description of the kind of spreadsheet that we get 
to describe the problem as a programmer. We'll do a bit of an interlude about Python and the kind of Python snippets that you need to know and be aware of. I, a room like this is always very uneven and some people know some things, some people know others. Get all of us um, at the same level and then we'll basically write enough bits of the reflection uh, framework to make it work. Where am I? Uh, this is the thank you, but I'm not yet here. So, what do I do? I have to move to the uh, IPython notebook. So if you excuse me, I'll mirror the displays and hope everything works. Nice. I keep this configuration. Yeah, actually, this is where we are. Good. So. Nice. So remember I told you we had a tester and a lab jack. And the first thing is I should tell you what that thing is, right? Oops, what happened? This is. Uh. So let's start. So. We have a tester, this is a physical device that connects to a medical instrument, both of which are, are um, described by spreadsheets that tell you which connection is connected to what. So um, I'll show you the spreadsheet in a moment. So the, the ask, the commission is, Javier, please, we need to, Javier and David, who was my, my workmate at the time, is we need to write a program for a laptop that talks to the tester, and then the tester simulates things for the instrument, so when it comes back, we know whether the instrument works or not. Right? So far, so good. This is, by the way, I'm not a hardware person, so I know a bit about hardware that I picked um, along the way, but if I could get it, then it's. So the way this is done is you put a circuit board inside of the tester, and the tester has this thing as a lab jack that intercepts Think, think uh, Neo inside of, the, of that womb, right, before he takes the pill. So the, the, the little circuit board thinks it, it's in an instrument, right? So the actuator that would normally turn on a fan is actually turning on an input. And the sensor that would normally take, take um, information from a temperature sensor is actually taking it from an output. So what you do is you do things like, OK, I don't want to be in the front of the projector. You, you want to write a program that does something like, let's simulate a high temperature. And then let's see if the fan was turned on. Right? Let's simulate a low temperature and see if the fan was turned off. And that is essentially the program that we're going to write. Or more, more likely, we're going to write um, an API a library that allows you to write that kind of program. So the engineers can then write many of many. So um, we don't have a lab jack, right? But we have something that I call a mini jack. And the mini jack is something that I wrote a piece of software. And I really would like you to stop me if at any point this is, and this is why I said, uh, Please get, get close. So what this has is that I can, I can simulate input, and I can simulate outputs, I, and I can read outputs by being a human that reads the GUI. This is what the lab jack would be in the real tester. Right? So um, let's see this bit of code that I just run. It just imports a mini jack object. Uh, it waits a bit here, but it just creates and starts a GUI. It's the equivalent of connecting to a, to a device and just waiting. And the way you would use it with the mini jack is, let me see how this is done, because I need to go. OK, I'm going to run this. So you see that all the, um, all the inputs in the lab jack are a zero. So this reads zero. But if I go and you know, move the analog input 
1 to be 17 and the 2 to be 3 and make the digital input to, uh, what do I do? Right, so this is like if it had a physical signal connected to it and my little object could read it. So far so good? Are we here? And we can write. So, so I wrote 17 and, and 47, which I wrote by getting the mini jack and saying I want to write that, that output. And so far so good. So the problem that we have there, by the way, this is um, really nice because it also fails when you try to write to an, to an input, right? So it says, no, A1 is an input. You want to change it, you change it by putting a signal through it, not by writing something from the Python API. Any question? Someone's raising their hand. By the way, um, questions welcome, interruptions welcome. Elizabeth is there with a microphone. So you raise your hand and you'll get a microphone, so it, al it also goes on the recording. So this is the, the the mini jack API that I've kind of done and so proudly. But the problem is that the actual object that you're given in your job has kind of an insane API. So I really enjoyed um, Carrie Philbin's talk. Have you been there in the keynote? When she said about all these things, and she's completely right, because you have these, you know, get I AI state one, two. And you don't know what this means. You don't want to program with numbers, right? Set DO state 1, 0. It's, it's really not very good. Why? Because what we really like to do, what is the problem with this? Is that in order to test, you know, you want to test whether the fan turns on when the temperature goes up. So what you have to do is, oh, the example that I have is the machine can't work unless the door is closed, right? So if the door is open, the machine should say, nah, not working. So you write it like this. And you have to go look in the spreadsheet that describes the instrument and see where the door close sensor is to the pin. Look in the spreadsheet which describes the tester and see what that pin is connected to in the tester. Then in the tester description, you also have which pin is connected to which lab jack, and then you have to remember whether the signal is active high, active low. That drives you nuts. And it's error prone, it's time consuming. <coughs> you could do better and prove that you can, you know, write C in any language. <laughs> is, voila, right, we just wrote one to D to the digital output one by making constants. And that is better than the other option, but you still have to maintain these constants in your code by hand. And if something changes, if there's a bug, if something has to be rerouted, if the, if the device has a new revision, and the device, either the tester or the instrument, are different, then you have to go through all your testing code to change <coughs> where the connections change. So we'd like to have a more Pythonic API. And by the way, what I do is I often make a constant spy file, so all of these would be in a, in a central place. Still, far from optimal. What we'd like to have is this kind of code, which doesn't work because we haven't written the tester object yet, right? Can you read from the back well? So we'd like to write something like tester mainboard door write the open state, right? The door, the machine has a sensor, so we have to write in order to simulate the states. And the fan can be turned on and off by the instrument, so with the tester we, see, we have to read whether the machine actually did it. And of course it doesn't work because we haven't written, even tester is not defined. But this is um, the approach that the people of, um, of Hoodie, which is a, uh, um, a web framework that I like, they call it dream coding. You define the API you need first, and then you write the thing that implements it. And by the way, this API, 
I would defend it in many ways. It's geared to the engineers that would use it. So would it be better to write get, get and set instead of read and write? Maybe, but not when it's hardware engineers, because they use write and read to and from signals. Would it be better to have not the board that it's connected to, just test the door, test the fan? It would be an option, but not for this job, where what they are doing is testing the actual boards, and they like to have it very explicit in their code. It's a question of also the Zen of Python. Explicit is better than implicit, and they wanted it this way, et cetera, et cetera. So um, trade-offs have been made according to the people who will be writing testing programs using this code, who is the engineers in this, in this company. By the way, neither the person who wrote the tester, nor uh, the main testing program, nor I, who wrote this API and bits of it, are now in this company. So we're writing something that's more maintainable for them, too. So this is what we are going to write, right? Now, this is the bits of Python that we need to know. Please stop me at any point if you think, oh, I didn't know this. So I'm going to start. We're going to use something called Dict Reader, which takes a CSV file, or a CSV file, a comma-separated value. In our case, it's actually tab-separated value um, from the, the code base and slurps it, analyzes it to read it. We're going to be using a default dictionary. We're going to be using the dunder methods get atter and call. We're going to be using punctuals from functool, and that's about it. So don't worry if you don't understand some of this. Um, I'd rather you didn't hurry me along because you already know it, because there's always someone in the room who doesn't, but is a bit shy about mentioning it. So I'll try to be fast, but kind of exhaustive. So CSV dict reader. I have this. Um, spreadsheet with cliches that I wrote, right? And it is, it has commas in it to explain why we make a CSV, despite the being called comma separated value uh, files, actually tab separated values. The reason is we don't want them comma separated because some of the fields may have commas. And these spreadsheets often have comments, right? So the comments people write long uh, free form and they put commas in them. So you don't want that. So you save the spreadsheet as a CSV, which is, by the way, another thing that I recommend. You don't work with a spreadsheet. Spreadsheets, they can go on your code base. They can't be diffed just with a text diffing tool like git diff or whatever else you use. So uh, you just save it as a CSV. And then the code does this. Um, I've already run it. I don't need to run it again, but let's go through it. I import both CSV and pretty print in order to print it. And I make a dictionary of cliches, which is where everything will go after I've slurped it from the, from the um, um, spreadsheet. And then I say, I want to open the file. And then I make a reader of it. And I say, yes, the delimiter is a tab. And I also quote the fields with, um, with uh, what is it, quotation marks, double quotation marks. This is something that you can pick according to the spreadsheet that you're given. Like if someone uses a lot of quotation marks, maybe you don't want to do that. Some of them are just numeric. You may want to do another kind. Um, this is very, very useful. And what it does that's, that's useful is that for every one of these rows, it makes a dictionary. So it makes this dictionaries, um, country Australia, drink beer, uh, country Spain, food tapas. And it makes these, these dictionaries. And what I do is just. I put them in the big dictionary, and then I print it. right? So this is as simple as that. Now we have something that is the way we work, because you know, I assume that all of us use dicts all the time. That's the way we, we work in Python. So of course, then, you have to massage this the way that is convenient for you. So you would put this in a database. You would normalize it, denormalize it, make it searchable by, by food or by drink, because that's a thing that interests you. Count the number of languages or count the number of times that English is, appears. That is something that is application specific. This is how you get your, oh, what did I do? You get your, your data in a dictionary. Then default dict. Is, um, is an interesting beast. So 
Default dict is something that um, simply creates sentries every time you try to access it, and there's nothing there. And it's useful for making multi-dimensional uh, multi um, dictionaries. So this is, let me run it. So what's interesting, let me scroll a bit, because that way it will be. OK. What's interesting is that you put in foo with a value of 5, and then foo, of course, appears. But when you try to look up the key bar, which you never put in, 0 appears. So far, so good. You can do this with dig.get. But the interesting thing is that not only that, but it's also become an actual item inside of the, of the dictionary. And well, what you do with dig.get bar, the result is the same. You also get a 0. But when you try, when you print the items, the bar isn't there. And when you print the bar, um, you get an exception, because you never put it in. And you say, yeah, Javier, but why are you telling us? Why? Because default dig takes a callable. So what did I do wrong? Oh, I didn't write default dig. Right. Where did this? Right. I'll fix it. This is why I had it. So you have a default dig that gives you a dictionary. So when you access, you, you haven't put um, a nay key anywhere. But when you access it, it still gives you a dictionary. Things say it will be an empty dictionary in which you can put something in B, right? So things say B. Uh, I can I can print it out for you. I know I know. No, I know this is. Sorry, I'll I'll be with you in a minute. Was that a question or a, or what you were telling me? The bug. Huh? The bug. Yeah, it's um, what I wanted to show is how to make something that will be able to, to make by default the next level. So instead of having um, the default being a dictionary, we have to make the default being a default dict, right? So we do nice lambda. And this should. OK, I forgot how this works. Uh, this is not good. Uh, yeah, thank you. Good. Thanks a lot. So this time, we have a three-level, a three-level, um, a three-dimensional dictionary in which the last one wouldn't be default, but we can, we can put things in it um, arbitrarily. So now we can say things A, C, C, D, uh, D equals R, right? And then we can look this up, and it will appear. And you say, Javier, why do you need this? Well, we need this because we're going to have to store things in two dimensions. We're going to have to store signals or data about the signals by board and signal name. Remember that our API, we want to write an API that was like test. Uh, we want to write an API that looked like this. And this will eventually have to look in a description object that is a multi-dimensional description and looks here. Ah, uh, well, yeah, this other name. To get the description out. Right? So our code, 
a code in order to be able to, to put the descriptions in to make a big description when we're reading the, the <laughs> spreadsheet, and in order to be able to, uh, to after it late, to, to access it later by these two, uh, let's call them namespace variables, the method names that are fake method names. We'll need to have a place to look them up, and we'll look them up in this multidimensional dictionary. So far, so good? Yep. So, the next thing that we need is, look, we're going to make a tester object that doesn't know anything about boards and signals because it's all in a, in a description. So it needs to know when to go look up in the description. And in order for do, to do that, we're going to build a little um, call builder, an API builder that, that does it. And to do that, we'll use get atter and call. So um, I like to get the temperature of the room. And please don't be shy, because um, it helps more if you say, no, I don't know about this. Who knows about Dunder methods and has used one at, oh, you know, at least once? Right? And who hasn't ever made a Dunder method? Right. So actually, half and half. Good. So I have a presentation that I prepared earlier. I'll, I like this kind of stuff, where I explain Dunder methods. You can stop me. I'm going to do something, which is I explain them now in a presentation. And then as I go down the code, I'll explain them again, but with examples. Because I think that's the way I learn. Like I read about the theory, and it kind of washes over me. But then I get it the second time, because I remember I saw the theory. So please, by any means, stop me. Interrupt me if you have questions. But uh, mind that there'll be a second, there'll be a, like a catch up later, and that's where you can, you know, ask all your questions if you want. So, again, if you want. So, get out on a call. They are the Dunder methods for returning attributes from objects and making objects call. So, let's start. And I don't start with water Dunder methods. By the way, this can be, is it? Presented. Am I doing this right? Right. So when you do something like banana dot split A, you get all the bits of banana that are separated by A's. This is a normal existing string method that we've all used. But interestingly enough, white space, which is significant in Python, is not always significant. Uh, we can isolate two bits, which are the bit that does the attribute access, the bit that looks up the split method in the string banana or in any other string, and the bits that call the method split with the value a, which are the bits that make a callable into a value. Right? That's what calling a function is. You get a, a callable an argument, and you return a value. And that is calling. So let's start with the dot. The dot separates, the dot has two functions in Python. It's easy, but so one thing is qualified names, and the other thing is separating objects from attributes and accessing the attribute to set it or to get it, right? We use this either when we want to change the value of the attribute or get the value of the attribute, whatever the attribute is, including a method. And this is the thing that makes calls. So this syntax can be intercepted, right? So the dot syntax performs access of the attribute, and this syntax performs function calls. And the cool thing about Python Dunder methods is the Dunder, by the way, I call because they have double underscore in front and double underscore in back. You can't make them up. There's only a limited number of names that exist that Python gives you. And what they do, if you see a Dunder method, what it says is, hey, this is a hook, so the syntax of Python can work for you. If you write a function with this name and two underscores in front and back, then the syntax will do what you want, not what Guido wants. Well, that's cool. Guido gave this us, so gave us this. So an example is that you often define stir so you can print objects, right? Many objects are unprintable things. 
So you, you define a star or a Unicode for them, and it, suddenly they have a printable version of themselves. And len is the method that is called when you call len on an object. So we can do this thing. We can do the crazy thing of making a string that lies all the time. I'm a bit out of time. When I do this in, in classrooms, I run it, but I think you know, also the, the younger, less experienced people, you get it. So I define a method in here that is called len. And this will act like a string in all respects, is that when you ask it for its length, it will tell you 1,000. It's a string that lies, right? And the cool thing, again, is that it's the syntax of Python. Python gives us a built-in function, len. And that function that you know Python and the core contributors and Guido and has worked forever suddenly does something different, which is kind of insane here. But it's just because you know we need this to be a bit of fun. And the other thing in the middle is so you see that it still behaves like a string. You can iterate through it. You can index into it. You can do all these things. So the thing is, we can also overload the dot and the parentheses. So when we want to do tester dot name of the board dot name of the signal dot write and put um, little parentheses, there's a way for us to make that work even though the tester method doesn't have, the tester object doesn't have um, a name of the board method. It has to look it up in a, in a description dictionary, right? It will look it up in the description dictionary thanks to the fact that we can um, get at the, the, the moment we see a dot. And once it, it does the call, it'll have to decide to validate whether these are good, right? So these are two different problems. One is building a call that you could pass tester banana, um, you know, Michael dot foo. And that would be a, a, a well-formed call. It would just not be something that fits with the description. So first, something that uses Gatata will build that call. And then something that uses um, call will, before you gives you a, a returns a value or tries to set a value, it will look in the description and say, hey, this is insane. This doesn't work. Oh, yes, of course. So, so this is a demo of call, which, in which I make a number you can call, right? So you can actually call my number in the Python sense of calling, of putting. Um, so I make uh, a callable integer, in integer that returns, calling this number, returns a string. And this is where I show you that it's still an integer. So I can add it. A equals B is still true, because this is a callable integer of 1, and this is 1, so it still equals 1. It's only different in the regard that if you try to, to call um, number 1, the actual integer, you will say, Mac, integer is not callable. But you know my callable integer is callable, so I can call it. Right? So I think this is it for, um, for Danda. Let's see. Getatter and setatter. Um, let's, let's do this too. So this is um, an object. Let's see. This was a good way of doing it. So this is from a library where I learned all of this, by the way. Credit, credit is due. I didn't know any of this till I started using a GitHub library that is something like 200 lines of code. So the good thing about short code is that it has less bugs and it's more understandable. I could read it. So I printed it and read it on the bus going home. And by the time I was home, I already understood it because it was that short, not my merit, but Mitchell Yao's. So he made a JSON object that works like JavaScript object in the sense that you can um, access it with dictionary semantics and also with object semantics. Right? And as you know, Python objects don't work like JavaScript objects. Right? If the dictionaries, you can access them with dictionary semantics. And if the objects with properties, with data properties, then you can access them with um, method and attribute, sem uh, with attribute access semantics. Sorry. But you normally can't do both. Right? So um, if I'm going too fast, no? So how is this done? Well, you write 
a get adder and set adder. Right? So every time that get adder and set adder get called every time there isn't actually an attribute. Right? So Python, if you say um, object dot attribute, it will try to find the attribute inside the, the object. And once it doesn't, it'll say, oh, let's go to get adder, see if there's a rule. See if, there's, see if there's an actual method that someone wrote to deal with this case. So what this does is uh, easy, because self is a dictionary. So it just looks in it with the uh, dict semantics. So you're accessing it with attribute semantics, right? You're saying um, a dot b. And what it does, since it's a dictionary, it says, oh, you want this a, make an index b. And if the key doesn't exist, then I'll give you an attribute error, because you accessed it like an attribute. And with setatter, it's much more easy, because again, it's a dictionary, so you just set it. And that's how setatter and getatter. So far, so good? Yep. So I would say that now we have most of the pieces for an API, because we can make a call builder that has a get adder and set adder. And what it does is appends anything new that comes. Right? You, in, you initialize it with an object. And then it appends anything new that comes into the list of arguments. So if you make call builder with 999, and by the way, it has a wrapper. So you, you can print it. And it says it just makes a tuple of the object that you put in when you initialize it and the argument list that you return. The important thing here is that getatter returns self, right? So let's see um, the call builder of 999, what it does. Let's execute it like we are the Python interpreter. So what we do is um, when you do this, it goes to the init. It has some object. The object is 999. It'll store it here, and that's it. It returns this call builder object that has an empty arg list and some object. And there is an A. I'm going to go to the other side. Then you say A dot unicorn. Forget about this bit. A dot unicorn, what does it does? Is there a unicorn property, either a method or a data property in this object? No, it isn't. So Mac, it goes to get adder. By the way, this is, this is looking at it in a get semantics. If we were looking at it in a set semantics, it would call set addicts. If we, if we had here an equals and then another value. So, so we're here, right? And it says a unicorn. So it puts unicorn here. And what this does is it depends. So now the object a has 999 in self object and a list that only has the word unicorn. And then it returns self. So this is still the A object, just with more things inside. Then you put dot demo. It tries to access the demo method or data attribute of the A object, which is a call builder object. Is it there? No. So we'll go to get adder. And in get adder, it will append it to the list. So by the end of this, before the potato, what we have is that A is a call builder object that has 999 in self object and both unicorn and demo in the arg list. And then it returns self, so A unicorn demo is still the same object as A only mutated. And by the time we do potato, the same thing happens. So when we just, you know, the, 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 the CLI, the, the, the Python REPL just prints the representation of it, and that's the object and the arg list. We've built something that is a data structure that represents this API. So far, so good? We're only one step away from building the call, right? One step away from building the call. What does calling do? Call tries to find the call method, the dunder call method of the thing. 
So here we are. Uh, this is not completely written. But should I, should I? Oh, Dan, I was so happy with myself. OK. So callable, let's see that there's a description. So there's a description. Right, and we have some way to extract the method of that description. So what call should do it is return the resolve This is not the best description. It's much better later on. I apologize for this. Yeah, it's called Arglist. You're right. My apologies if I've lost you. So this is um, a quick and dirty. So when we get the call, we could do something that is look up in the description, uh, the description that we have for the API, look up the callable if it's there. This is not what we do, by the way. I'll tell you why later. But look up the, the, the method from the description and the arguments, and then call it, and remember to return the return, because we expect some return value. And if not, then the callable doesn't give it to you. It returns a none, and you return the same none. Yes? Um, the Can you? Can you get the microphone? Wait for the microphone, and I'll get the previous slide. Yes. Uh, so you're trying to bring in default dict-like behavior and uh, using the underscore methods. The default dict is, no, not really. The default okay. dict. I introduced because we'll need it in order to build the description as a multi-dimensional dictionary. So you need default dict to build multi-dimensional dictionaries in an easy way. So you can just say um, your description will be indexed by, in this case, by board name and by signal name. So that's why we needed uh, the default dict. And the only difference between a normal dict is uh, accessing things inserts it into the dictionary. So yes, accessing things uh, by keys that don't exist inserts a default in a dictionary, while with a regular dictionary, in a default, um, so in a default dictionary, it has a default that will be inserted every time you try to access a key that doesn't exist. Okay. So when you're using the, um, when you're trying to Introduce the ability to access the dictionary via uh, you know, dot access. You mean in the JSON object? Yeah. So it's not here. Yeah. This is an example of something that's similar. What is the question? I won't interrupt the question. Okay. So is this is this a requirement of the API, or is it just to make it easier? This is an use? example. This is, thank you. This is an example, the best example I could find uh, how I l and how I learned of how to use getatter and setatter to intercept the syntax of Python. So a dictionary, you can't access via dots, while a JavaScript object, you can. So this little thing, JSON object, makes, gives the behavior of a JavaScript object to a dictionary by inheriting from it. So it does everything a dictionary will do. Plus, when you access a key via a dot, it will look at itself and do the same thing, but with dictionary semantics, with index semantics, 
and uh, when you try to set a value via a dot, it will do the same thing. So to link both things, what, I've, what, what you do is you add to dictionaries an API of only one level, whereby you can just put in um, um, something that looks like an attribute, and it will be, it will be treated like a key. So it is, in a way, a way of dealing with defaults, and in that way, it's similar to a default dictionary. We are doing the same things over and over, which is how to make objects deal with arbitrary inputs instead of the inputs we define statically by writing things into the code. Yep, that's right. Yep, that's what so I the default dict allows you to insert um, things into objects that are not there yet because the key was never put in. And this allows you to answer to attributes that were never written in because you never wrote code with that attribute, um, me method with that name. Okay. Right? Thank you. You're so welcome. The idea would be, so once you've actually... Can you wait for the microphone, please? So the idea would be... On, on. Um, so once you've actually built up the default dictionary, you then freeze it or you convert it to a normal dict. Yeah, yeah. Something that I, that I do for safety, that's a very good question. So since a default dict has an unpredictable behavior, once you've, try, you've finished building it, what you usually do is to just um, convert it to a dict by saying, you know, blah, blah equals dict of your default dict. So you freeze it that way. Sometimes you don't care, sometimes you have bugs, like I only freeze the first level, and then, but that's a very good question. You want to do that after you've built it. So, um, remember, this will all be available afterwards. So, when you want to write your own, you get the code. Um, I apologize for this because for work reasons, I'm a bit late and I'm still, um, you know, cleaning it up from all the client confidential things that may have still be there, been there and asking for permission and, uh, I mean, I already got permission and the code, but you know, making everything, putting the dots on the eyes. But you'll get this in a runnable version that you can run yourselves, particularly the IPython, uh, the IPython notebook. So this was the end. And if we go back to the, oh, this is where we were. If we go back here, the last thing I want to talk about is called partial. Oh man, I'm running out of time. Oh no, I have 10 more minutes, good. Partial, which is a clever thing that allows you to put arguments into a function even though you don't have all the functions. So, Normally, you apply a function to a set of arguments. That's what a call is. You, you, give, you get the call, you put in um, a bunch of arguments inside the parentheses, and what you return is the function applied to those arguments. All of them at the same time, or the thing will fail, and it returns a value. Thank you. So, um, and it returns a value. And that's what you get, right? You get a full application and you get a value from a function. That's what we're all used to having. How many people have done any formal computer science or on their own, they already know functional programming, they know what a partial is? Just, so I'd say a fourth of the room, so this requires a bit of. So, a partial, what it gives you, is a function that takes less arguments because some of them have already been applied. That's why it's called partial application. It's a partially applied function. So I have this as an example. I'm going to do cool things. So I just made a read that when completely applied, this would return the value from board signal. So this would return the, the, the value from some board any signal. So if we applied partially, we can pass a function that has some or all of the arguments, but haven't been called yet. So did I have partial? Yes. They're here. So I can say, OK, let's write it this way.
So it takes a single for X board. What I can do is delete this, right? Read, read normally takes um, two values. Here we're giving it only one. So it will return a function that will take the other value. So now let's write at the end and see what happened. So it tells us that this is a partial function, right? So this is now a function since we only pass the first argument. This is a function that will pass. Let me show you on the screen. This is a function that will take the other argument, right? And will produce the result. Let's see if this is true. See? We made a function. We made a function that had part of the arguments, and then we added the last argument and called it with it, and it just worked. The clever thing with partials is that you can pass all of the arguments. So you get a function that already has all the arguments and that you haven't called yet. <coughs> and why do you need this? Because remember, we make these things in a separation of concerns. One little bit of code will build the call. The other one will validate it before actually making the call. So you need a partial to pass it as this thing, validate it and run it if you want. But I've just built you it. So our um, tester object, you could tell it, uh, you, could, you could write you know, the crazy thing that I wrote, test a banana, blah, 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 blah. It would actually build that call and pass it as a partial. It wouldn't try to call it. Something else would validate it reading the description and read it. So this is the thing that we're going to see. So uh, so Oxford some signal. There you are. Now, again, I've already passed all of the arguments, right? Haven't I? I've already passed all of the arguments, but I still get a partial function. I created this function object that in this case, since I pass off all the arguments, it won't accept any more arguments, but it will still be allowed to be called. So now I have all the pieces, and I thank you for your patience. Yes? Uh, yes. So if you build a partial function and you give it six args when the argument's meant to have three args, does it error on the call or does it error on the construction of the partial? That's a very good question and I think it should error on the, on the construction, but let's see. It errors on the, on the construction. Sorry? Was it? Is it erroring on the call? Oh, you're right. It was erroring on the call. Nicely seen. Yes. Why? I'll have to think about it when I don't have my head full of those. But thank you for, for watching it. I was meek. So I'll leave it here as a reminder. So now we have all the pieces that we need. And I was thanking you for your, for your patience because have you seen Titanic? Who, who hasn't seen Titanic? <laughs> oh, 
it's actually a very good example of script writing. So whatever you think of Cameron and his politics or the actual topics that he deals with, Titanic is an amazing film from the point of view of the craft of, of storytelling because I saw it with my granddad who was born only three years after the Titanic and knew everything about the Titanic, right? Growing up, a boy in Bilbao, he would read about it in the newspapers as he learned to read. And I'm there who knows nothing about the Titanic. So if you remember the film, in the first 15 minutes, they tell you everything about how the damn ship sinks. So everybody in the theater has exactly the same knowledge about the Titanic, and then you can watch the story the same way. Otherwise, my granddad would have seen the story uh, like knowing what's going to happen to the ship, and I would have seen the story not knowing what was going to happen to the ship. We would have seen two different movies. So really, James Cameron, amazing script writer. Um, again, whatever you think of the stories and the politics and with that, um, I won't even argue with you. So this was needed so, because now we know the same chunks of Python that we need. We know how to read a CSV and build an arbitrary multidimensional dictionary where we keep a description of the API. We now have to intercept the, the uh, syntax of Python, the dot and the parenthesis, to build calls. And we also know how to make a partial call that we can pass around without applying the call to the values for it to be called, so we can validate that before we call it, which allows us to have this thing that is a separation of concerns, so the call builder could be used for any API, right? And then the API could be really used, um, again, with you pass it a description, and could be easily be made also generic, as long as you pass it a description in the right chain. So let's see the actual spreadsheet. By the way, this is not the real data. It has kind of the same shape. And this was like a big, huge, um, two big, huge spreadsheets, actually. I annotated them together. So I've taken out a lot of craft that is needed, left some of it to remind you of what the programmer would have to do to check by hand that, you know, that this signal is connected to this port, that is connected to this, that is connected to this, that is connected to the lab jack. But basically, as a programmer, if you had to use the API provided to you by the LabJack people, by the way, amazing um, hardware things, the API not so. For instance, it doesn't have callbacks. You can do things asynchronously, and that is kind of meh. So what you would have to do is look this up by hand and you know, build those functions. But once you have this spreadsheet, what you can do is write this kind of code. And this kind of code, which is now going to fail and later will succeed, is the kind of thing that we want our engineers to write. Remember, at the end, we're solving business problems. We're making life easier for others. And so they want to say, OK, first, we simulate that the machine is working properly. The door is closed, yes. We, the sample is present, yes. And the temperature is perfect, You know, room temperature inside the machine, which is never true because machines get hot. And then let's check that this is a medical apparatus that has living samples in them. So let's check that when the temperature goes to 37, you know, it's already above 36. So it turns on the fan and the heater off. And when the temperature goes to 35, which is below 36, it turns off the fan and the heater on. And this is the kind of thing that we want the engineers to do, right? Right in the domain. And they can look at the signals when they're debugging the hardware if it has problems. So this is for you to read later. <coughs> the many things that don't exist. OK, so some things for the description have to be seen. So yes, analog signals don't have high alias or low. And if it's a digital signal and doesn't, that means the high alias is on and the low alias is on. But these are complications. These, these are only some of the complications. The text that you can read later contains many more. But this is only some of the complications. So let's implement. This is a programmer trick. You know how they tell you you should never, from a module, import asterisk, import everything? There's one exception, which is your constants.py. We already have a convention for constants. Nobody or nothing, not the interpreter, not the compiler, and uh, I don't know, even linters in, in Python or static analyzers can check whether something is a constant or not. We just have a convention to warn others, right? This is in all uppercase. It's a constant. 
So what I do is I make a series of constants that I call symbols that have the same value as themselves. So read is um, a Python name that has the, the value read. And I plop it in locals here. And then I import it into the global namespace wherever I go, and I use it all the time. And you know, send me to jail if you want. I have many more of these in the actual application. I have to change them every now and then, and a lot at the beginning when I'm developing. And I don't care what you think. It's much more convenient <laughs> to type without, without the quotation marks. So this, right, now works. The names have themselves as a value. They're like symbols in other languages. And then we're going to slurp the spreadsheet. I'm going to go a bit fast, because I have this code available to you. And I think there's value in reading it, probably by yourselves. But after what we've done, this is not the important bit of the code, right? We agree that the important bit of the code is the one that builds the API. This is the one that just reads the spreadsheet. I just want you to see what it does. So it will fail. It does validation and everything. So if it has a bad row. It will tell you things like, hey, you define two lab jack ports for a signal. Don't do that. Because you need to do that. You need to validate the data as early as you can. You can't wait till the call is being made in some cases. So this is, again, what I said about your programming. These things are not doing it by hand. It enforces business rules. Right? In this case, it is a technical rule that a signal can't be connected to two uh, devices at the same time. But otherwise, you see that it does. I have a row and a row with default aliases that didn't have any aliases in the row. right? And it will give me the aliases 0 for off and 1 for on. And by the way, I do this clever trick sometimes. Depends again what you're doing. But a dictionary that is bidirectional. When you're sure that both, both values and items are unique with respect to each other, you can do this. And it's a dictionary that will convert one from the other. This is a cheap trick. It's a shortcut. I was doing a tutorial. Maybe you don't want to do it in production too much. The actual production code always returned tuples of the hardware value and the mapped value. And there were many checks. But again, if I do this in a tutorial, we'll never get out of here. So. Again, this is the bit that I don't think it's necessarily useful to go through the code, but yes, to see what a description looks like. Thanks to that trick with the, with the uh, default dic, we have a multidimensional dictionary that the Oxbow di dictionary contains all the signals you know, in, in um, Oxboard, which are found running heater and sample temp, and the main board contains all the signals, which are DO, instrument temp, and sample temp. And inside, the dictionaries have the shape that we saw that describe a signal. How are we for time? Are we struggling? How are we for time? Got 20 minutes. 30 minutes to go. 20. 20. 20. Okay, so I think we are fine. So. So remember, we have an end goal in mind, right? We're not doing this to be clever. We're doing this because we get the, the business advantages of uh, being faster to iterate, having less code to read and write, et cetera, um, change things. But in this case, it's really awesome that a developer can write this, and absolutely no comments are needed, and not have to write this. So, all this effort is for something. Now, remember what I've said before. I'm going to be repeating it. You have, this is the way I architect this code. And I'm actually, um, I could defend it. I feel like I could defend it anywhere. You have two different objects that have two different uh, functions in life. And the call builder is absolutely um, ignorant of the actual um, hardware model that we're dealing with. The only thing it does is it makes a call out of all these things. And this is bad for many reasons. And the last one is bad for all of these would come out of the call builder as, yeah, this is it. You do whatever you want with it. 
It is the tester, the one that has the description of the hardware, and validates it. So that way, you, it's also better for debugging, it's better for reuse, it's better for everything. So let's see the call builder. And so we have half an hour. We're going to get into the guts of the actual call builder. So it will be the write and read functions that we pass, the one that will validate the data before doing the call, right? So um, when you build a call, you say, please build me an API call with these read and write functions. Why do I have more methods none? Oh, yes, because it keeps calling itself. So the first time that I call it, it just takes the first method and it puts read and write inside itself for later. And then let's see, uh, what did I do wrong? This is kind of tricky for space. OK. Let's see first the bottom to see what we don't need of the function. It will represent it with a series of dots, so you can print and see what happened. When it calls itself, you can't call it. You can't call the uh, call builder object because it's not a callable. It returns a function at some point, right? It returns a partial function, and um, yeah, it does string. So the only thing that matters here is what it does when you okay what it does when you call it with um, a method remember uh, maybe I should have somewhere to write let's call the first Okay, we only have two methods here, so plus read or write. So let's call the first one board name and signal name, right? These are the things that we're going to pass, the actual words board name and signal name. So the first time that we call it, we call it with the first method, with the board name method. And we put the board name method here. And um, there's no more methods. We haven't passed anything. So there we have. It returns this little object, a call builder object that has a first method in it. And then when we put a dot and put the second method in it, which is signal name, right? The thing that has board name in it does as follow. If the method is in call map, it means it's read or write. And we are ready to produce the callable and return it, right? because we know that the things that are callables are read and write for this particular one. So we pack everything together. We get Oh yes, self call map method. So the method was read or write, so we get the actual read or write executable that were passed when we initiated it. So here we get the read from tester or the write from tester. Then we get chain args is all the arguments that we've received so far, all the methods that we have. And then we return a partial with them. I don't know how, how understandable this is. It's the kind of thing that's. What's the chain do? Chain is an absolute. Just like arrays. Of they should work. Yeah, you're right. This is embarrassing. Chain is something that takes a series of, ex uh, of sequences and gives you a sequence. So actually, this is better. Are we cool? This should work equally well. Right? So. If the method that we pass is either the word read or write, because um, method in self call map means that it's one of the keys, if, if we put 
at the end of a method called the string read or the string write, what we get is out of this, we get the actual executable that we passed, read or write, which is passed by the tester object. And then we get all the methods together, which I, I built this um, when it was more general and was going to have more methods. Uh, probably could have done much simpler since in, when it actually works, it has to. So mea culpa, I committed the sin of overgeneralizing the code for complexity that wasn't needed. So then I get all the methods together, and then I partially apply, remember, the asterisk is I have a sequence of arguments. I put it there, and I call it. So this is a call that I haven't yet made. It's a callable that all it needs is uh, to put the, the uh, parenthesis at the end in order to return a value. So the tester object pass this to the, um, pass its, its uh, read and write to the call builder, had the call builder build a call. Remember, I could say banana, fing, fong, foo. It doesn't matter. It will validate it before calling it. It can't validate it before. You understand? Because this is the thing that accumulates all the names that you put separated by dots. So it's not like it can validate it before the call is built. But what we get thanks to partial is that we can build the call and not make it. And partial gives us a function that we call and generate a value instead of giving us the value, which is what a function called us. So if the method isn't, isn't read or write, what we do is we uh, it, instead of returning self, it, it does um, like the other one, it does a, a recursive call. So it says, OK, I want another call builder object. Since it didn't give me read or write, this is not the end of the chain. So the first time you put board name, and the second time you put um, signal name. So it says, OK, first method is still board name. The methods are whatever we had before plus the new one that you've given me, in this case, it's signal name, and then I get the read and write because I'm going to return the same object. This time it has board name here, and it has a list that only contains signal name plus read and write. Then if we say tester, board name, signal name, banana, then what it will do is boom. OK, board name, this has now signal name, comma, banana, and let's make an object that has, you know, board name, read, write, and now it has signal name banana in it, et cetera. So it's making the, the long, um, I don't want to use the word chain or string because they have meanings, they know series of names followed by dots until you find the, the strings read or the string write, and then it will pack it all into a function that all you have to do is put the parenthesis behind and call it once you've validated it. So far, so good? Haven't I completely, completely lost you yet? No? Good. So this builds the calls. So let's see now. Oh, I didn't. Right? So if I pass it the right method, I pass it a function that will just write all the arg list, right? That will write everything in order to make it easier for everyone. What we get is that foobar a boo write, this is a cal builder that we pass a method first. So we get a method, and then a, and then boo. And then it, it uses the um, write, so it finishes it up, and then we call it. So in if instead of passing here print arg list, we passed tester.write, this would do tester write a method, second method, boo. Could validate it or not, right? So let me write it here. So if, if instead of doing this, 
we said test a we have test a write, which we've written. It exists. And then we do my call equals call builder uh, put name read equals known. It will fail because test write doesn't exist, but it will write equals write. OK. Ah, test write isn't, uh, isn't defined. OK, that is fine. So then we can do my curl signal name write. And since we saw that with fuba a boo write produces a method a boo, we see that this one will produce. Okay, let's do it with tester underscore write, tester underscore write, which is going to be actually equal. And then my call, single name, right? And this should work, right? It's passing board name and signal name as arguments. So the call will pass to the tester object that can validate. And in this case, board name and signal name would be good, because we would have chosen them well. Good? Should I stop? We have. We're actually kind of perfect for time. We have 15 minutes to finish. So I don't think this use, I mean, again, I invite you to stop me in the corridors if you want. Interruption better may be better than questions at the end. If you pass an argument to write, where does it go? The argument I pass to write? If you pass an argument to write, or if you pass like a parameter, if you call write with a param. <laughs> Where's that go? That goes to, that is a very, very good question. What it does is this is a partially applied function. This is the answer. I have to pass an argument to write because I pass value. I don't pass an argument to read. The answer is that the function read takes one less argument than the function write, right? So read basically takes, um, the arguments for validating the API, and write takes the arguments for validating the API plus the value. So it will be those functions that will, and that's the reason why, by the way, partially applied functions fail when you apply them. Of course, because you have to be in the moment to call them. They can be a function of a function, etc. So I have a, an answer to my own conundrum, and thank you for your question. So. We're almost here, right? So we have read and write, and this would write open and to main board door. So this is your answer, right? The API builder um, makes the same partially applied, but the write has one more. I actually had it in my presentation. I'm starting to feel a blur, so <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, have some coffee. Still, if they have a blood tested uh, conference presenters. So now we have this tester object, right? And tester right, one is a call builder with this um, write function that we defined above. And it's the same thing as saying, please give me a partial of write and these carefully produced argument list that I've done by hand. So the call builder does this, makes this argument list, passes it to a partial, and gives it. And you see it because 
both of them have exactly the same result. I can see, you know, I am tied, but I know this material. I'm sure you're tied too. I appreciate your patience. So how it all works? As I say, the code will be available to you, and you'll see all of this in operation. Now that I see this, I think this call bill is actually too complicated, and if I were to do it again, I'll make it simpler. But uh, because it's too generic, it tries to do so many things, and knowing that I only had two arguments, I should have done that and probably validated at that point. So how it all works together. I'm going to close this thing and maybe make sure that I don't have anything that I shouldn't. So now this is the actual tester object that does everything that it should, right? And um, let's go through it. So I import all the constants. I import the tester object. I um, import sleep because I need to give things time. And then I make the descriptions which, by the way, has a default value that already reads from the spreadsheet, so I don't have to pass it the spreadsheet. The two mini jacks are only a singleton object because <laughs> I already spent too much time shaving that yak. And then it works by a, by a client server thing, so I have to make a connection that's called start GUI. And now it's working, right? And then I make a tester that uses the description and my list of devices. And now I have a tester object where I can actually write this. And this is now the challenge. I have five seconds to simulate that I am the instrument, right? So the instrument board will have to manage the inputs in response to the outputs. So first, the thing won't fail. And when it writes closed, you'll see that this goes to 1. And when it writes present, I don't know, maybe this is 0, I, the things are opposite, you'll see that it writes 18 and 36 to simulate the good working conditions of the instrument. And then it'll do the thing that the code will have done during testing in manufacturing, right? The board is inserted in the tester. And what it does is it writes 37. So this value will be 37, one of these two. And then it will wait five seconds for the machine to, well, it waits less, right? This has sub-millisecond response time, but I'm a human simulating the thing. It gives me um, the fan is on one and the heater is off one. So I have to put both to one. And then when it says 35, I have to put both of them to off. And if I manage to do it in time, it'll tell me I've succeeded in the test. So, so, thank you. So, I realized this was a lot of tutorial. I was crazy. In my plan, I was also going to show about code generation with Django models. That proves I, I have the same relationship with time that dogs have to food. You know, they, <laughs> never mind the size, the thing they can do. So um, this will be for sure published in some way, including that I might even clean up the call builder object and make it into a more intelligible one. But I think um, you know, the enemy of, of, the, of the good is the best. So I'll try and publish it as soon as, as I can. Um, I do have something here, which is uh, I promise not to use any of this for spamming, which is that this is my email address. And I will publish it here. So this is my email address. And don't worry, please write to me. Like, uh, I suggest. If you, if you make it easier for me to find it, you can call it Pycon AU15 MPS, which is what I've been calling it 
you know, meta programming with spreadsheets. And if you write this and you put this in the topic, I will remember to email you when this thing is on. I think we still have we still have five minutes for questions. And as I say, I have another talk tomorrow, and I'm equally. Sorry? 15 minutes for questions. That's amazing. So um, I have another talk tomorrow. So if you could please wait <laughs> until after that, because I'm a bit caught. But there'll be tea time afternoon tomorrow. And um, you, know, I'm, you can find me. And I'll appreciate anything that you want to ask. So I don't think it's. Has anybody got any questions? Has anyone got any questions? Or maybe not questions, go back here, or recommendations? Really good talk. I love that like complexity. It's good. Um, so not directly related to this, but the other uh, Django thing. Yes. Do you generate code by just printing out the code, or are there yes. some like OK, so this yeah. just wondering if there's libraries available where you No, no. I can show you it is. It is, um, so what I have, and I have, by the way, I have permission to do all of this. I have amazing clients that say, oh, yes, of course, you can open source this. And uh, this is a public utility. So the personally identifiable data is private, but all the schemas and everything, um, but all the schemas and everything are public. So. Uh, no. So this is very, very low key. Um, one of the reasons I've done this instead of the, of the Django is that from the moment I suggested the talk, I sent it to now, I no longer work from spreadsheets, but we've actually <laughs> written a dialect of SQL that we use to describe most of the models, and then we supplement it with a spreadsheet. So it's a bit more complex in ways that weren't advertised. And I still don't use a parser. The next deal will be use an actual parser, build an AST. But also you have to, to think, you do this to save yourself time and problems, not to do the cool thing. So I would do the parser only if we got to a point where, OK, the complexity is too much to manage, it'll be easier. For now, um, the language is actually a regular language, because we only pass each line of SQL. And each line of SQL has a very limited set of options and it's not recursive or anything, so it can actually be passed with, with regular expressions for those of you who have a computer science background. So often do the thing that works. I just have template strings I can show you. I have a template. So and my my template, this may may benefit from right. And my template has a bit of code that's done by hand, which I use when I'm developing the actual um, simulator. For instance, the clean method, for those of you who, who don't know in Django, you, you use a clean method when you want to validate one field against each other. So you use a validator for validating a field on its own. When you want a field against each other, you have to do it at the form level, use the clean method. So uses a generic thing that I pass a description of the. So this is already. Though it's written by hand, it's the basis of the generated code. Because this is where I do my little model for the site and the client, which are very small models, and I can do by hand. And once I've created this function, which is uh, a function that gets called to do things instead of another, then I put this thing in the validated, which is here. And as you see, I just plop it in with a Jinja tag, but it's, it could be anything. And the reason I use Jinja instead of the others is because it deals, uh, I need to embed the, the uh, things that have, that have um, what do you call it, uh, curly brackets. So I don't want to escape them. It's, it's easier for me. So um, if, you, if you want to see the code, it, it won't do much. But it makes a rules dict. Oh, this is not the interested one, by the way. This I I built in the way of having, you know, an IPython an IPython notebook and then a big file of functions. So once it worked, 
I took this out of the IPython function put, uh, notebook, put the functions in the file, and started developing like a, like a normal human being instead of like a catman, like a caveman, you know, uh, toddler. So it's the same thing. It's I make the rules, then using that, I, I read the SQL to make the models, and then applying the rules to it, and then I just make the template. So I have functions that, that have the different um, separation of concern, and this is the thing that has, you know, uh, boom, 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 fill exceptions for those. So you see, this is the bit where, where code generation comes super handy. So there's things that haven't been, that haven't been decided yet, and you know how these things work. So my client, who's awesome, has a data consultancy that actually works for an institution, that actually works for a regulator, that actually works with energy producers. And these people are still discussing the shape of the energy programs, let alone the data. So I would not be able to do anything, or I would have to be changing things by hand. Here I have like, oh, these fields I'm not even using. These are my field exceptions. I'll put them in, I'll plug them in when, when they are. So a good technique that hasn't much to do with technology is this trick whereby you do a couple of it by hand, and that's how you develop the infrastructure that you need for the code generation. And then there's one of the models that I'm not doing until the end, even though it's already specified. Why? Because it's my quality checker. It's when I think I have all my code generation, and they say, is this done? Then I run it against something which I've never dealt with, and that will catch up new bugs, but it's the equivalent of training data on different data than the one that you, that you do. And in the past, this has worked for me. Like I did this with the, when I did the instrument, I did that with all the boards, and then I left one by the end, and then I saw how well the code worked, and I only had to pick up a couple of bugs. So I hope this will work for me too. So, so I clean up the rules, right? And here I apply things like, hey, I wish sure that the validation schema you know, the spreadsheet that they've given me has the same headers that I already know about, right? My generation code was written for a certain spreadsheet. If they give me a new one, I want it to go Mac if they added, if they've added columns. So then I make um, an iterator for, to read tables. So every time it reads the word uh, table, it chunks it separately because it will be a separate model. And then I have, right, this is, the, this is one of the most interesting things. So I have a template for the model form where I will put, you know, I'll insert the name, and then another, another one for the clean method that you've seen that is generic. And I have a set of rules that I generate. The clean method are actually generated from a spreadsheet. So this is, from a point of view of, um, of cleverness, it's a bit less clever. You're just whacking text with each other. It's easier to understand to invent by yourself if you want. So this I invented by myself. The other one I only discovered because I read the code of GitHub Pi by Michel Yao, right? So, uh, which reminds me that there's something I haven't done and should be done. And it's here, what have I done? Which is, is my acknowledgement. So I really think there's a great benefit to learning from people who you don't know about. By the way, Michel Yao and I, the only words we've exchanged is when I submitted a couple of bugs or improvements to the code, and he said thanks on GitHub. I don't know about him, but I've learned from him. And I really want to thank him. And I invite you, of, at all levels of programming, to find programs that are short enough that you can print in two pages reading the bus. Now that we have internet in the bus, that's terrible. But before we had internet in the bus, didn't we get more things done? Graham Cross at Client Innovation hired me for this job. And uh, you know, I was kind of untested. and has never worked on hardware, not professionally anyway. And um, Adrian Higgins is the Adrian who maintained the spreadsheets. Actually, other engineers did it for him. And you know, it's amazing to have a client when you tell him, I know we have a deadline. I'm going to spend two weeks. I was working only two days a week, so this took about four, week, four days. I'm going to spend you know, two weeks of calendar time writing an API so the test can be written better and be more readable. And someone that says, yeah, it's amazing because most people do, you know, uh, what is it, uh, more speed, less haste, 
and some people do the opposite. So David McAuliffe was the, the guy in charge of writing the tester, and I appreciate his help and his trust, and he was he reverse engineering um, a serial wire protocol that was really, really wiry. And uh, you know, we worked very well with each other, and he was the one who had to suffer my bugs at the beginning, and everybody else in Planet Innovation. They were absolutely great. And I also want to thank Jen at Sound Data, though I've never, I haven't been able to actually show the Django code generation. Again, it's amazing to have a client who, when you tell them, yes, I want to do this by code generation, because that way you can just edit the description, and I render them into code automatically. They say, yeah, of course. So thank you, I guess. I don't know if there's more questions. Any no? more questions for Havia? No? Yes. Um, I have a question about the um, the metaprogramming stuff. Yes. Using the Dunder methods to build up the argument list. Yep. Um, when I'm consuming an API like that, I like to say in IPython, you can tab complete to see what's available on an object. Um, obviously, that doesn't work in this context. Extremely good point. Extremely good point. So yeah. GitHub Pi, I really like, because GitHub Pi is always complete. Because it doesn't know anything about the actual API. It just generates a call, makes a call, and if the, the API endpoint doesn't exist, it returns the error that GitHub gives you, gives you. So it's always complete. The problem is you can't mock it because it doesn't know what the API is. You can't run tests very well because you don't know what the API is. I mean, you can run tests against the call builder, but not against the GitHub API. And you don't have those benefits of static. So the difference between static and dynamic is that static is that anything that's written as text in the program, and dynamic is everything that isn't written as text in the program. And this being dynamic and no static, um, has those drawbacks, like your ID won't be able to complete your methods. I think this is worth it in many regards. Like these are things not for huge consumption, though the, the, the code generation does that. The code generation makes Django models that then you can interact with in that way. So the, the, because it makes all those um, method names and, and fields and everything, it makes them static in the literal sense, computer science sense, of making them present in the text. So that's a very good point. This has drawbacks. The reflection as, uh, approach has drawbacks. It's a, a pros and cons. And I think for us, it was a, it was a um, 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 planet innovation. We had deadlines. And you know this had to be done and was good. But maybe for an API for public consumption, you don't want to do that because you want the wider world to have uh, tooltips in the ID. I have a follow-on question if there's time and nobody else wants to ask. Um, do you think that dynamic class generation could help in this case? So instead of having your Dunder method to, d when, once you call, you go and look up what you need to look, could you instead read in your spreadsheet and create the classes on the fly at runtime? So, um, so, no, that, this is what I mean, is if I create classes, I'll write them as classes and run them out of text, which is what I do with Django. Essentially, Django models are classes, and Django fields are attributes that you know, build objects also through, through meta class magic. So, the, but that's me. Something tells me that if I'm going to have to debug a class, I might as well have it written, have it available to my debugger, to, to you know, the ID, et cetera. And if I'm going to do something at runtime, uh, let me avail myself of the benefits of reflection, which we don't here. Like, this would allow you to change the API live if the hardware reconfigured itself, et cetera. And that's something we don't do, but it would be available to us. Thanks. Thank you. That was a very good question. Thank you, everyone. You're awesome. You're, you're all still awake, and very few people left. And if you have any further I don't blame them. If you, if you have any further questions, you can seek. Yeah. Him at. While you're here, we might present you with a much sought after Python cup to contribute to your caffeine. Thank you.